Hello everyone, and welcome to the 50th episode of Tech Life Skills with Tanmay. My name is Tanmay Bakshi, thank you very much for joining us today. And as you all know, I am a developer at heart, right? I absolutely love working with technology and really building technology in particular. Now on Tech Life Skills, I try and cover technology from a wide variety of different angles. And today, we're gonna get to take a look at the part that I think, personally, is the most fun, actually building and deploying the technology solutions themselves. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're being joined by a very special guest, uh, Steve Martinelli, a senior technical staff member at IBM for developer advocacy. Uh, Steve has, has 11 years of experience at just IBM alone and has spent a lot of those years working with cloud technologies. Now, Steve has been a wonderful guide and mentor to me. Uh, I've learned a lot from him personally. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was the one that introduced me to the you know, professional world of technology and actually helped me gain some experience in that direction um, and so we also of course have a lot of fun together right um, as a matter of fact actually one of the things that's annoyed me most about COVID is the fact that we haven't been able to get Wendy's for a long time so hopefully we're both vaccinated soon and we can uh, we can get our favorite burgers together again. Uh, but we're gonna get to hear from Steve today some of the major different ways that you can take applications you've built in this specific case, uh, a simple app written in, uh, in Node.js, and actually deploy them to the cloud with varying levels of difficulty and, and control. And so, without any further ado, let's welcome Steve to the show. Hi Steve, how are you? Hey Tanmay, thanks for uh, thanks for having me on here. Um, that was a very nice intro that you did. Thank you so much. It was great to be there on your first real first day of work uh, to be the one to bring you into the IBM building and, and make sure you knew where everything was. You knew where your desk was. I still remember that day. It was a very nice day. Um, and uh, you know, here we are now. Got to agree. It was uh, really fun. You know, no, no Wendy's to to <laughs> eat over, but uh, it's. Uh, <laughs> Next maybe maybe I'll, I'll pick it up for lunch in, in, in honor of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe I will too. That that that'll be fun. Um, but yeah, I know. I mean, once again, thank you for for being on. You know, it's 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 been great to to to, to be working with you for for so long, and now to finally actually have you on the show to to talk about technology. Um, as a matter of fact, actually, before we dig deeper into uh, into into what we're talking about today, you know, I'd love to know a little bit more about you to start off with. Um, so so just really quickly, would you like to introduce yourself? You know who you are, how you got to doing what you do, and then we'll dive into tech. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, well, see, back in the day, I was born. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, no. So uh, what happened was, uh, so right now I'm in developer advocacy, um, and I've been in this organization for a few years now, for about four or five years. I think we're going on five years, four years, four years. Uh, before and you know we run the IBM developer website that's developer.ibm.com we run events digitally with clients um, online on our crowdcast channel mm -hmm. uh, we publish tutorials articles blogs on the developer site mm -hmm. and uh, before that I was actually heavily invested uh, in open source which still holds a very special place in my heart I was uh, heavily involved in the OpenStack infrastructure uh, project mm -hmm. from 2012 to 2017 uh, where I was lucky enough to uh, be a uh, team lead for uh, one of the components of OpenStack. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, I was actually working on a bunch of product teams at IBM. Uh, one of the teams that I interned with was the WebSphere uh, development team and mm -hmm. test team there, and uh, went on to, that's where I actually got started at IBM uh, when I finished school. So it's been uh, been quite a few different teams there over the years, uh, different, worn different hats, um, you know, product development, open source development, different priorities there and now developer advocacy. So it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. Very nice. I can I can tell the the common theme is that you've always loved, you know, working with technology and actually being able to build it and not being too far removed from it in your career, am I right? Yeah, that's right. I think um, you know, one of the best parts about being an STSM at IBM is that you're never too far away from technology. Uh, but you do get a little bit more ownership over some, you know, business decisions and and input at that level. Um, but yeah, it's uh, you know, I like staying uh, I like keeping my hands dirty, getting close to the technology there, making sure I can still, you know, run some applications here and there, and um, you know, leading teams and showing and using bleeding and bleeding edge technology, showing and showing whatever is, you know, um, 
whatever is new. I right. like playing around with new stuff. Absolutely, right. That's I, I feel like every developer is is uh, just loves doing that. I mean, I remember um, the uh, a thing I'd seen uh, online a little while ago, which is you know developers even even when they go on vacation, they're still coding. It's like you know they they, they <laughs> they'll, they'll they'll get a break from work and they'll be finally it's time to code my own projects now. You know, so yeah. always always having fun working with the with the latest technologies. And I, uh... mm -hmm. go ahead. No, I, I, I had a I had a relatively quiet weekend where I didn't, you know, I'm always kind of like working a little bit on the weekend or something, yeah. <laughs> you know, when the kids go to bed. But I actually had a pretty quiet weekend. And instead of, you know, using that time to like watch TV or something, and I ended up uh, spending too many hours updating my blog site and redesigning it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was, that was not... Maybe that wasn't the best use of my time. It's it's this innate drive that we all have as developers. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> got it. Got it. Got to use what's new. Um, but yes, no. I would love to start off now getting into the actual technology. Just before you go ahead and share your screen and actually we start digging into stuff, though, I do want to quickly take up a question from Akash Gupta, actually very much related to what we're talking about today on the stream already. Uh, Akash is asking. Uh, I wanted to ask. I've learned to develop web websites using Python and the Flask library, um, and now I want to take uh, the next step. So how can I get into and learn cloud technology and related applications? Um, so any advice on what resource to use to learn cloud? Well, I think you should be using IBM Cloud. Um, <laughs> Um, no, uh, for, for real though, it's uh, it's a great choice. Uh, if you uh, there's a free tier account, um, we call it a light tier account, where you know there's monthly quotas, but you're likely never going to go over them. You don't need, need a credit card to sign up or anything like that. Um, and yeah, there's uh, yeah, I think like using a Cloud Foundry uh, option, a, a pass option, like platform as a service, mm -hmm. um, where they have Python runtimes there. You should be able to you know actually deploy your Python application. Um, on IBM Cloud relatively painlessly. Um, right. So so actually, to, to expand on what you mentioned, Akash, since you said you're using Python and the Flask library already, um, so the first thing that came to my mind, which you know Steve's confirmed, is, is using something like Cloud Foundry would make sense. Uh, we're going to be showing you how to actually use a couple of those different um, techniques today. Uh, so feel free to stick around and actually you know watch us implement this uh, and actually do the deployment. Uh, but also, uh, Steve, I, I do believe that you have a course relating to IBM Cloud technology as well. Would you like to tell maybe Akash and everybody about that uh, as a resource I, that they can use to learn about the cloud? I do. There's a course called, uh, a course on, it's actually published on several, several uh, platforms now. It's on Cognitive Class, uh, edX, and um, Coursera. Uh, it's called uh, IBM Cloud Essentials, where we cover, you know, all things IBM Cloud from, you know, here's the dashboard, here's the CLI, here's how you use it. Um, and then we cover into, you know, here are the different infrastructure offerings or storage and compute options. And then we cover the deployment options like Cloud Foundry, OpenShift, Kubernetes. And we finish it up with uh, with our um, with uh, an overview of the different IBM Cloud services, the AI services, database services. Mm -hmm. And again, like the, the course is free on Cognitive Class. So uh, take a look. Maybe Sounds you'll be good. interested there. Wonderful. Yeah. I'll go ahead and put a link in the description. Uh, but to start off, Let's go ahead and dive into what we're what we're talking about today. So, would you like to maybe share your screen and tell us a little bit more about what it is that we're going to be building today and 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 how we're going to do it? Sure. And just so you know, I don't really have a strict agenda for this. We're just gonna we're just gonna try some things out and see how it goes. And uh, you know, feel free if folks in the chat have any questions, go ahead. And Tammy, I'm sure you've got some commentary you can provide. Um, mm -hmm. So let's just uh, let's. Just Take a dive. Take a dive in and see what happens. Sounds good. So I, I just want, I have one slide. I promise. I know IBMers <laughs> often go slide heavy here, but I have one slide I want to show folks. Um, and that is, you know, the different as a service kind of compute options um, where you have the traditional infrastructure as a service that's, you know, block storage, virtual machines, uh, things like that. Then you have containers as a service that's, you know, where Kubernetes and OpenShift comes into play. Platform as a service, where you're using tools like Cloud Foundry, and Functions as a service, where you're using uh, uh, serverless platforms like uh, Knative or OpenWhisk. Mm -hmm. And I want to just put these out here in this kind of like order because 
as you go from one end to the other, uh, you're, you're sacrificing more control for more development speed you know, in my mind. So, you know, with function service, you can pretty much try it right out of the gate with platform as a service. You can also just like push some code up. You'll see it running right away. You don't really have that much control over the uh, the uh, how it's hosted and you know that level of granularity that you're going to have at infrastructure as a service. So uh, just be aware of that. So it's kind of a trade off here. Are you going to go full control or more development speed? Mm -hmm. And I think um, where the industry is kind of going toward is containers as a service uh, offers a good sweet spot there in the middle of control and speed. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so. All right. Uh, anything that I do today is going to be done uh, with this uh, code base here. It's my simple hello world uh, written in Node. Um, so I've cloned it uh, locally over here. And let me know if I'm actually going a little bit too fast, if I, I'm switching windows a little bit too fast here. No worries. I think we're good uh, for now. So it's, um, you know, let's just do this. Uh, so. It's a very, very small program. Uh, the entire thing is just basically going to say, hello world from IBM Cloud Essentials. It's the application sample application that I use for the course that I created. And uh, it's just gonna run uh, on port 8080. Mm -hmm. All right, pretty simple stuff. All right, so um, let's go and run this locally. I think that's a good first step, right? Let's yep. make sure that our application runs locally. Totally. So let's do a NPM install. It's a node application. So if you're not familiar with that, uh, what it's going to do, it's going to look through your little package.json here. It's going to find any dependencies, uh, install them there. And then you can do an NPM uh, start. And I should have all the steps outlined here in the readme. So if you're not sure uh, what to do, I've outlined most of the steps here in the readme. So let's run it locally. All right. So it says it's running on port 8080. Let's actually pop that up. Oh, that's 8,000. Mm -hmm. All right, there you go. There's our hello from IBM Cloud Essentials. So pretty good, right? We, I think we've all kind of done this, you know, hundreds of times. It's our sample hello world application. <laughs> Nothing too fancy about this. In some language. Now, yeah, in some language. In one language or another, we've done this. So now let's, you know, let's let's show how easy it is to deploy this on Cloud Foundry. So we haven't containerized anything yet. We're just going to take this code and say, hey, Cloud Foundry, uh, run this. So I've already logged into my IBM Cloud account um, to, with, through the CLI over here. Uh, this is just the help. Um, you can ignore that. Uh, but what we're going to do is um, when you're using Cloud Foundry, it's actually going to look at these uh, this specific manifest file. So over here, it's going to give it a name. And we'll do uh, dash Steve Mar at the end to make it a little bit more unique. It's going to specify a build pack. So for a cache, he would specify the uh, Python one here. And you're going to specify how much uh, memory instances and whether or not you want a random route, which is a random URL. Otherwise, it's going to use the name. So for fun, let's just see if this works. Um, and do you want me to increase this a little bit? A little is bit, that, yeah. That would be good. Perfect. Is this too big? No, I think like this my, is good. This is good. OK. Oh, this is. It's a little bit too big for me, but I'll, oh. I'll manage. <laughs> uh, all right. So if you want to use Cloud Foundry, uh, what you want to do is you want to type in IBM Cloud CF push, and that will push your application. So let's go ahead and give it a shot. Let's see what happens. So when you run the Cloud Foundry push, what's actually happening in the back end? Is it taking your code and sort of uh, sending that over to the Cloud Foundry service on IBM? You know, How, how, how does that work exactly? Well, first you have to actually save your changes there. Otherwise, that's not going to work. So, <laughs> um, but yes, uh, basically what it does here, it, you can read the log as it goes. Um, it, what it's doing is it is going to be talking to IBM Cloud in the background. So I'm going to flip over to my cloud console here and see if we can find this thing. Uh, but it is going to um, kind of like within a container, um, you know, it, it's going to download the build pack, the Node.js build pack over there. And then if you flip, 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 it's going to you know, push your code up because we're not referencing a remote a GitHub repo here. We're just actually going to push mm -hmm. this code, code base that we have up here up there. Uh, and then it's going to try and run a, um, you know, um, it's going to read it from your package.json. Usually it's an NPM start or something. So it's going to try to do that. Right. And 
So the way the Cloud Foundry works is, at least the way that I understand it, is that it expects your application to start like an HTTP server at a certain port um, that you specify, and then it gives you an endpoint right. at which to access that server. Right, and you can specify different like overrides within the manifest file. Like you can specify, hey, I want to run it with, you know, I don't want to run MP npm start, I want to run npm something else. Right. Um, so you can run, you can override that, I believe. Uh, but yeah, as you said, it does kind of expect it to be running on a specific port. Makes sense. So, okay, so it finished. That didn't take too long. It was about a minute of us bantering. Okay. And um, so this is the route that was created over here. So you can see it right there. Let's copy and paste that. And let's take a look at that one. Let's pop in that URL and see if we can load that up. There it is. Very nice. So it is on the cloud somewhere, and let's actually go find it in our little dashboard here. As you, as you find that service, I do already see a couple more questions from the live stream, uh, sure. including questions from SimaCon and Sushmita K. Um, I, I do want to kind of start off um, really quickly, maybe with uh, the question from Sima. Uh, Sima's uh, saying <clears throat> that she's already learned. Um, she, she's a beginner. She's gained some theoretical knowledge of computer science from uh, college and wants uh, practical knowledge uh, for actually, you know, using it. And, and, and building technology. Um, so where should I get started doing that first? Um, she's already learned uh, the Java language. She's learned about DBMS, uh, front end and back end. Um, and so she's wondering where she should start off in terms of learning how to code. So any any great resources that, that you know of, Steve? So yeah, I've kind of got two different answers for this one. And it reminds me of when we first met, actually. Um, so you know, my advice to you at the same time, which is the advice that I like to give to a lot of people, is that uh, within your career, you kind of want to be, I, I call it like, and I think a lot of folks call it like a, a T-shape in terms of skill. Mm -hmm. You want to be, you want to have a wide breadth of knowledge, at least like, you know, surface level knowledge of a lot of different things. So, you know, it, it's great that you have, you know what I'm create an app, back ends, front ends. But I would really encourage folks to, to start to know like some of the more, you know, what was a traditional sys admin or now kind of DevOps or SRE kind of world mm -hmm. where you learn about how, you know, applications are actually run uh, in the real world mm -hmm. um, and not just, you know, what's done on, a, on your laptop. Um, and that, and for that, I think like the course that I mentioned earlier, the Cloud Essentials course really kind of covers that broad top level thing. If you're looking for something more uh, specific, I would need to kind of know what that is. But um, you know, there's so many great sites out there. Um, you know, the the IBM Developer website has you know, thousands of assets you can, and uh, each asset has uh, usually a corresponding GitHub repo that they can learn more information at. So, uh, I think one of the best things uh, you can do is, um, you know, if you've written one application already, try writing it in a different language. Uh, just to see if you can do it there and that at least, you know, gets you whenever you're learning a new language, that's an excellent practice that I like to do. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, like, think about trying to automate something. That's another one that I like to do is if you find yourself doing a manual task too often, uh, try to automate that usually with Python or something. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I like real world kind of useful things <laughs> right absolutely right it's it, that's that's also something that um, as a matter of fact if you take a look at for example my first book hello swift you know in a lot of the different applications that i build to actually you know teach different programming concepts uh, a lot of those applications are based off of things that you would do in the real world that net with that we can now automate with an app so like even yeah. if they're relatively simple things that maybe you wouldn't do every single day like you know calculating the area of a triangle or um you know do, doing relatively simple things solving a maze right these are just you know tasks that are interesting um and can help you gain some practical experience with different computer science concepts and yeah i absolutely love what you said about having that that t-shape sort of um, sort of expertise within technology because I think that is just so incredibly relevant because there have been so many times where I'll be working on a project and and like one of my friends will come up to me and say you know there's this bug I'm experiencing and I'll be able to help them out or or, or I'll be working with some technology in some way and they'll they'll just they'll just ask you know why do you know that like it's such an it's such a weird obscure thing to know about like why do you know about X thing about CPUs or about the ARM yeah. architecture or whatever. And it's just because, even though I definitely don't know it in depth, right? I'm not an expert in everything, by no means am I. 
I'm just interested in all of this enough to have that knowledge where I understand it to be able to use it, not necessarily enough to be able to build it myself or explain it, um, but enough to be able to use it in the thing that I am sort of focusing my expertise on, right? So, so I would yeah. say that would be, you know, I, I think that's great advice is have that sort of T-shape of, of, of expertise uh, and, and be really good at, uh, or not necessarily really good, be really good at, at like one thing, but then have surface level knowledge at a bunch of different things, right? And so yeah. whether you start coding with a resource like one of my books and then learn about the cloud and DevOps and these sorts of things from the IBM Cloud Essentials course, you know, that, that could be one way of doing it. Um, but yeah, that's, I really like that way of putting it. Oh, well, yeah, and there's always, always going to be, like, new technology popping up. So I think just, like, keeping yourself fresh and being able to learn new things quickly, at least at the surface level, enough to just kind of, like, you know, get whatever the hollow world equivalent is of blockchain or AI so you can understand that and have conversations about that topic. Um, I think that's important. Yeah. Uh, just keep you fresh, keeps you always learning. Um, and, and, you know, all this stuff kind of builds up uh, from, from uh, existing technology. So, you know. No, we wouldn't have Kubernetes without containers. So, you know, get to know containers, get to know Kubernetes, get to know, you know, OpenShift, all these sorts of fun little things here that are now becoming very, very prevalent in the industry. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, actually, speaking of, uh, speaking of OpenStack, uh, there's a question uh, from Demon Aurora asking, uh, between Apache CloudStack and OpenStack, uh, which open source tool for managing infrastructure as a service is better to learn from an employability perspective? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would say, uh, you know, OpenStack definitely has a, uh, a niche right now with the telcos. Um, I know they, they use it a lot there. Uh, so there's still a lot of uh, usage going on there and a lot of um, a lot of still development happening there. So I would, I would lean toward OpenStack, but I'm a little bit biased because, you know, I worked on it for like five years. <laughs> Makes sense. But no, I, I personally, even though I, that's not like a side of technology that I use a lot since I don't actually work on like the infrastructure end of things usually, um, I, I will say the part, the, the projects that I've seen have almost all been OpenStack. As a matter of fact, I've very rarely seen cloud stack in the industry myself. Then again, could yeah. also just be, you know, the specific field of technology that I'm in or, or, or the specific area. Uh, but I would say generally I've seen OpenStack much more widely used than something like cloud stack. So that's what I would recommend. But again, really depends, you know, do your research. That's just what we, we, we think yeah. would be, would be good. Um, to, to add to the confusion now, there's actually, uh, so uh, I think a lot of folks actually get mixed up with OpenStack, which is an open source project, uh, and then OpenShift, which is a Red Hat open source project also. Um, uh, OKD is the open source one, OpenShift is a product. But, um, but yeah, OpenShift is to run containers, it's built on Kubernetes, uh, whereas OpenStack is more to uh, manage your you know, it provides an infrastructure as a service um, kind of capabilities there. Makes sense. And we'll get actually the two together. Interesting. Yeah, and we'll get deeper yeah. into, I believe, OpenShift today. Um, yeah. Yep. In, in, in just a moment. Um, and so uh, we will go ahead and do that. Just really quickly, one more thing I do want to answer. Sure. Um, this one is, is, is interesting, actually, from a career perspective as well, because I, I do know that, you know, as, as, as we've talked about, Steve, I mean, as, as you've tried to progress your career, you've always wanted to stay true to technology still and actually be able to get your hands dirty and actually work on tech, right? Um, uh -huh. And so with us actually asking, you know, I'm working as a Java developer, but I want to become a software architect. Any thoughts on how to make myself better or, or advance my career in that, in that, in that sense? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tricky one. I mean, you know, a lot of folks, you know, when you're applying for a job for that role, like software architect, they want to see like, you know, do you have experience in that? And really the only way you can get experience with that is if you you know, do the job. <laughs> um, so it, it's a little, bit, a little bit hard. Yeah, it's a bit of a catch twenty two there. Um, but yeah, there's, um, you know, I, I'm sure there are courses online that you can take that kind of give you that intro to cloud architecture uh, thing, and and that's where you know if you're a Java developer and you're just, uh, you know, focus that very much at the application layer as you focus on cloud architecture um, stuff. Now, you you know, getting to know the different cloud providers out there. Uh, IBM Cloud, 
Amazon, uh, Azure, all the different cloud providers, you have to know like how are the different components, what do they have similar, you know, what's the equivalent of cloud object storage on Amazon? Mm -hmm. uh, because you'll find that, you know, more or less all the cloud providers kind of have the same, same, pro same offerings, just different names. Mm -hmm. So I would start taking a look at, you know, those different, um, you know, some of them even offer free certification programs like the Ivan Cloud Essential mm -hmm. one. Um, I know that AWS offers one too. Um, it's the same thing. I mean, when you create as a cloud architect, you're going to be creating much more complex kind of solutions because you want to now have security involved. You want to have load balancing involved. You want to make sure you can be a scale up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you got to get to know those services one way or another. So either, you know, learn them kind of like on the job or start learning them outside. And uh, there's a ton of resources for learning about those. You got to got to do all of that while still being cost efficient on the cloud. So, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it, it it does become a, a challenge definitely, but it's it's an interesting one. And of course, you know, feel free to take a look at different courses, like for example, the Cloud Essentials course that we're talking about. Um, as a matter of fact, actually, um, there are two more questions that I want to get to: one from Shiva and one from Akash, and we will get to them very <laughs> shortly. Uh, but actually, they're both related to something that we're about to do now. So I feel like let's go ahead demonstrating the Cloud Foundry really quickly um, and then we will get to answering both of those questions very shortly, I promise. But now, uh, I, I know I did uh, take a bit of time to answer questions there, but now I, I'd love to continue uh, taking a look at what we were actually deploying. It's all good. Uh, it's been deployed up for a while now, as we saw earlier on our little uh, Zoom controls are getting in my way here. <laughs> uh, there is. So this is our route uh, that we got from our from the CLI. And uh, what you can do here is, uh, you know, should you need more uh, throughput, you can increase the number of instances and change the, uh, the amount of runtime memory that's available. Uh, you can see here I'm able to use a free tier uh, plan, so it's zero dollars right now. <laughs> so, um, so when you increase the number of instances, does it automatically balance the load between all of them, so it'll send requests to like random endpoints? Yep, that's exactly what it does. Very nice. Uh, and yeah, you can check out. So one uh, neat little thing here is that you can actually inject uh, environment variables from here. Uh, so if you needed to, um, you know, have an API key or something, you don't have to check that into your code base. You can just call, you can define an environment variable here. Uh, and then within your application, you can call, you know, if you're using Python or something, you call uh, os.env.get and then environment variable name. So, uh, you know, there's uh, environment variable support here. Um, some logs are available here and some connections to, uh, if you want to create any other, um, if you want to create a connection to another IBM cloud service, like say you have a, a Watson service spun up, you can create a connection there. And, uh, and then the credentials um, of that Watson service are, uh, are available as environment variables and they're injected automatically. So Wonderful. you can refer to them from your, um, from your application, actually, the Watson team does a fantastic job with their uh, with their SDKs, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they've made it very easy. So that if you have something in there, you just need to create you know call and call and uh, initialize, call a constructor and initialize it, and it'll just pick it up. It'll actually scan for those environment variables automatically. So That's super. Weird. As a matter of Very fact, actually, thank you for bringing this up because this exactly answers Shiva's question. Uh, her question is, uh, is it possible to use more than one service in a given application deployed on IBM Cloud? And the answer to that, to that is absolutely yes. Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, the way that I kind of view it is you know, when you have an application, like for example, something you deploy to Cloud Foundry, that application is in and of itself a service, right? And you can mm -hmm. tie different services together, you know, sort of have them call each other. Um, even services that you don't think call out to other ones, like for at least not initially, right? So like for example, Watson Assistant, if you were to spin up one of those instances, um, it's not just the Assistant, but you can actually use the Assistant to then call out using a webhook to maybe an IBM Cloud Functions instance. And maybe you have a Cloud Foundry application, which the Watson Assistant's added to and the Cloud Foundry application hosts the UI for the chatbot or something, right? So all mm -hmm. these things can absolutely not just coexist, but really work together for a single application. So feel yeah, free to do sure. that. <laughs> like uh, we've got a bunch of examples where our Cloud Foundry application is, you know, using some sort of Watson service like NLC, and it's also using a database. Uh, so we'll use Cloud and, uh, and, and again, those are specified in the uh, in the runtime or in the connections. So yeah, it's uh, yeah, totally. 
Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Let's continue. So, let's keep going here. Um, you know, I'm going to close the Cloud Foundry one. Hopefully, we don't need that anymore. Actually, I'm going to delete it. Ah, I'll delete it later. I'll, I'll do cleanup after the call. <laughs> so, um, so, what are we going to do after that? So, we've got it running on Cloud Foundry. So, let's go through our little chart here again. I'm going to do actually functions last, but I'm actually going to go to the uh, container as a service solution app. I'm actually not going to cover the infrastructure stuff. I'm going to try to focus on the container as a service uh, offering offerings that we have on IBM Cloud, and then I'm going to go switch over to functions. OK, so uh, container as a service. So if you don't know anything about containers, they're, you know, they're all over the place now. People are, every other cloud provider is offering, you know, fantastic support for containers as a service. And, um, you know, and you know, Kubernetes is everywhere now, and the cloud native ecosystem, cloud native computing foundation, cloud native ecosystem is just booming. And there's so many Kubernetes adjacent projects like Istio and Knative, uh, Tecton, um, and they are just uh, yeah, it's 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 uh, incredible how much the the growth has been happening there. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at what does it mean to kind of containerize an application, right? So and you know when i say containers you say docker that's kind of what become <laughs> i think that's what most people um think of when they hear the word containers so let's actually pop open the readme here um and i actually have some steps here um, let's close that guy uh how to actually run it in a container so we're gonna run this locally so like i like i, I always try to like run things locally first and then we'll actually see how it actually looks um you know uh, when you're actually deployed on IBM Cloud or on any cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, so over here, all you need to do when to containerize something, and this is me being a little facetious here because it's not all you need to do, but the most one of the most important things you need to do is create a Docker file or a container file. Mm -hmm. And you can use either Docker or Podman to interact with, uh, with the container. So mm -hmm. here's my Docker file. Uh, we're going to use um, the node. Uh, we're going to create a... Uh, our container from the node 12 container and slim just means it's kind of removing all the extra all the extra corrupt uh, we're going to create a, a working directory called slash app and we're going to copy our json our package.json in there and we're going to uh, run npm install we're going to copy the application that's been bundled expose port 8080 and then run node app.js so before we do that, let me clean up a little bit here, the node modules, because that's a, even though it's not too big, we should just clean it up anyway. And we're going to clean up the uh, package.lock, because that's generated also. So now we should have a fairly clean, uh, fairly clean uh, repo here. The manifest was altered, but that's not a big deal. All right. so. Let's build it. So I've included instructions in the readme as to how to build this. So mm -hmm. let's take a look. Let's also, while you go ahead and run the build, just letting everybody know, uh, if you do want to learn more about the world of Docker and why you would want to use it as developer, uh, we actually have an entire episode on containerization uh, with uh, the CTO of Nimbix, Nimbix Cloud. Uh, and so Leo Ryder uh, has you know, a lot of experience with containerization. As a matter of fact, he, was, he and his team were one of the pioneers in you know, bringing high-performance compute to containerization on Linux. And so do be sure to check out that episode. I will be linking to it in the description. Yeah, I remember when we were playing playing around with the Nimbic stuff in the P series. Uh, yes. I remember that back in the, that was like two years ago. Yep. Uh, good stuff. Hard to believe it's right. been that long. <laughs> yep. All right. So here we go. We we built our container. This is a very very quick one here. I you know um, I already had the uh, Node twelve image locally, so it just picked it up from the cache. Um, but otherwise, it runs all these commands that are specified in your Docker file. And there's so many different examples of this. You don't have to you know, rack your brain trying to find the perfect uh, Docker file in here. There's so many different examples and you can just find one that, you know, is similar to your needs. And basically what you want to do is just, you know, install the dependencies and run it, right? And you want to expose the right port. Um, okay, so here's the Docker run command. And again, this runs it locally with a container. Let's go ahead and try this URL. Open, hopefully it works. There we go, yay, right. it's working. And, so this is again running from the container. It's you know that port is exposed, and uh, so it's not running you know on my machine per se like it was in the node example. It's running a contain from a container on my machine. 
Right. And also one of the things that back when I was back when I was younger and getting into containerization, one of the things that used to confuse me a lot about it was, you know, I, I get containers, I get how they work on Linux. How in the world do containers work on Mac OS? Because they're Linux containers. How are they running on Mac OS? That, that was one of the things that actually used to annoy me before I realized that Docker is just running a virtual machine in the background uh, on Mac OS and it's running containers within the virtual machine then exposing it to you through the Mac OS command line interface. Um, so remember that when you're running on Linux, you're technically not creating like a virtual machine. It's just, you know, an isolated environment where you can run your processes um, on the same kernel uh, on Linux, but then on Mac OS, it's a virtual machine and then Docker, Docker or, or really your container service is running within the virtual machine. Right. And actually, one of our uh, developer advocates, uh, Bradston, uh, Bradston Henry, actually just had a fantastic. He's he's just learning about Docker. He did a great job of kind of documenting how he installed it, how he got his hands dirty with it, uh, and it's all published on dev.to or dev.2. Uh, if you Google uh, Bradston Henry dev.2, he did a fantastic job. He made videos and everything. It just looks so polished. Um, it's great stuff. Wonderful. Uh, so you can see here, I, I kind of did some stuff when you were talking there, Tanmi. I, I stopped the process um, using Docker Stop, and you know I'm going to flip back to it here. Mm -hmm. um, one thing to know, you know, if you're on a Mac, uh, where is it? Sorry, this Zoom bar at the top is uh, getting in, in the way of everything here. <laughs> uh, I believe um, if you click on a little arrow, it, it'll be like hide floating meeting controls. Um, until you hit escape and then it'll pop up again. That's actually the one thing is that, you know, when, 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 when Apple released the, the butterfly keyboard and the touch bar, the one thing that was the most annoying was, you know, now you don't have a physical escape key, so you can't use Vim anymore. Uh, well, at least not as easily. Um, and, and that's also a, a problem with Zoom is that you screen share, but then you can't really use Vim because every time you hit escape, you're going to get the meeting controls. <laughs> well, well, now, now I, I, you know, I won't be able to uh, stop sharing, but uh, it won't be in the way anymore. So, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Uh, so, if you are interested in using Docker, um, you know, install Docker on your whatever machine you're using, and there's support for you know Windows, Linux, Mac. Um, alternatively, uh, I know uh, Red Hat has a, uh, uh, and Docker is still open source, but uh, Red Hat also has an alternative called Podman, which basically takes the exact same CLI input. Uh, do I have Podman installed? I, nope, I don't. That's not good. I need to install that. Uh, but yeah, so Docker is another one. Uh, Podman's another uh, container is, tool you can use. Is Podman to Docker kind of like Clang is to GCC, where it aims to take like the same parameters, like the same command line flags yeah. and everything, just be sort of like a drop-in replacement? Yeah. As a matter of fact, you can even like alias it. So it's uh, it's nice. an exact drop-in replacement. Yeah. Nice. As far as I know. Um, okay. So. Uh, let's flip through the readme here because the readme was kind of like my, my little agenda here, sort of. Okay, so we run it locally, we run it in a container, we run it on Cloud Foundry. Uh, let's run it on the Kubernetes service. Okay, so this is where things kind of get a little bit complicated, but I think we'll be okay. So let's go and so, well, you pick what time is it? Well, we got time, we got 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so, did you want to? Try running it on the Kubernetes service or on OpenShift. Let's try doing Kubernetes first, um, okay. and then I think we should have time for OpenShift as well. Let's see. All right. So one of the things that you're going to need to do is whenever you're using Kubernetes, you need to reference a, an, an image, mm -hmm. and to do that, what you want to do is you want to be able to tag your image. Oops. Uh, so to do that, you want to tag your image. So let's run this command here, and. Make sure this is actually going to work. Just double checking here. I need to actually check the container registry to make sure I have this namespace available. Give me one second. All right, let's go over here. Kubernetes, the registry. And let's go to the namespaces. And so, you know, most cloud providers now have a uh, container registry where you can host your own images. The, a big one, the big public one that a lot of people use is Docker Hub. Um, if you go to hub.docker.com, it's, you know, you can find all, you know, there's official images from Ubuntu, MySQL, mm -hmm. Python. Uh, but typically, you know, folks, and, and you can put some stuff in there for sure. 
but uh, you know, if you want to create your own, um, you know, you you probably want it. It has more access control if you use a cloud service provider's um, Docker re container registry. Mm -hmm. Oop, it's already in use. Choose a different one. Okay, samples, Steve Marr. Well, let me see. Can we just reuse that one? All right, well, let's create a separate one here. Mm -hmm. so. While this goes ahead and creates, could you tell us maybe a little bit more about what it is the Kubernetes aims to achieve, right? So, I mean, we, we've already discussed sort of like containerizing the solution in, in terms of like putting it into like a package where people can just, you know, pull down the container and they've got the same environment, they can get up and running immediately. Um, but then what what does Kubernetes sort of add on top of that in terms of, you know, what, what does it enable us to do? Why would I want to use it? So the thing with containers is the benefits with containers are, um, you know, you're going to get process isolation, so that means better security. You're also going to get scalability with containers because they're actually much smaller than if you were to just run an application like on a virtual machine. Mm -hmm. um, and so Kubernetes kind of, with containers, it's not enough. It's kind of like having just the engine to a car. You need a car. Um, so that's where Kubernetes comes in as the it's technically a container orchestrator. Mm -hmm. So you'll be able to actually, it gives you all the, the rest, rest of the uh, ingredients that you need to kind of run containers properly on production somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to provide load balancing. Um, you know, it's going to provide APIs, load balancing, um, a full-fledged CLI. It also has like a vibrant ecosystem around it to provide networking. It has you know, uh, storage classes also, uh, it's just got so much stuff. It's got proper access controls. Uh, you know, just having, running a, con a single container is easy. Running hundreds of containers is complicated. Yeah. So that's kind of where Kubernetes comes in as like the orchestrator. Makes sense. So it's almost like, you know, from a very, very, very broad sense, uh, if, if you were to take some of the functionality, right, that, for example, a Cloud Foundry provides you, but then, uh, you know, have a containerization core and tons and tons of extra functionality on top of that in terms of networking and customizability and, and just general flexibility that you get kind of like a Kubernetes. All right, so let's go. So we rebuilt this. Uh, we rebuilt it and tagged it with a specific uh, version. And us.icr is just telling it to use the IBM Cloud Container Registry. Mm -hmm. um, and I called it Sample Steve Mar. That reflects the namespace that I just created over here. And let's try and uh, push this and see if it actually works. Ooh. Oh, right. I forgot to log in with my to the registry. Let's do that. Right. Of course, you do need to log in. Uh, also, another uh, really interesting question from Shiva while you go ahead and rerun that command, asking, what do you think about managing multiple clouds? You know, who uses uh, just, just IBM Cloud? And that's actually a really good point because a lot of different companies, including IBM, have been really doubling down on a multi-cloud and a hybrid cloud strategy, if I'm, if I, if I'm right. Uh, and so, you know, where the idea is that, yeah, of course, you'll want to use different services from different cloud providers just because, you know, they're the specific ones might suit your needs and the, yep. and to then support sort of bridging across those multiple cloud environments. So any, any thoughts on that, Steve? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, that's, you know, some cloud providers are really good at providing a specific um, in, in service that fulfills that business requirement. Uh, so I think the reality, I, I know some people don't like the answer, but I think the reality is that, yeah, you are going to have multiple clouds and, um, you know, maybe you'll use, you know, cloud provider A for general workloads and then cloud provider B for a specific one, and then cloud, cloud provider C for another one. Right. Um, and I, I think that's just the reality of where things are going now. I think we've, we've seen that for, I think the, the idea kind of came up a few years ago and that's kind of like, we're seeing that now it hasn't really changed. So I think that is actually the reality. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I was able to push this up here. You can see there I had to log into the container registry, but there we go. I, I, uh, I pushed it up in there. Mm -hmm. So if we flip back to the registry. Let's do that. Let's refresh the page. We should see something in there. And what we're going to do after that is I'm going to actually borrow, uh, someone on, on our team is uh, Pooja mystery, our wonderful developer advocate, who's actually on the live stream right now with Tata consulting on our crowdcast. 
Um, but I'm going to actually borrow Pooja's Kubernetes cluster here, and I'm going to uh, to borrow it. All right, so we've got our contain we've got our containerized application here, our little hello world. And what I want to do is I run it, I want to run it on this uh, Kubernetes uh, offering here. And the beauty of um, what a lot of cloud service providers are doing is they're actually providing a managed Kubernetes service, which means so what does the word managed mean here? Uh, so that means it'll be installed. Um, it, you know, it's kind of a one-click install. You can simply, you know, access, uh, you know, access the catalog in here. Say, I want a Kubernetes uh, cluster, and say, you know, how many worker nodes do you want? How much memory do you want per worker node? And spin it up. Probably anywhere from five to twenty minutes later, it's spun up, and you don't have to worry about actually rolling it out on your own. Mm -hmm. If you were to do this on premise or manually, it would take, you know, all day multiple days all week, uh, depending on how complex you want it to be. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's the trade-off there. I mean, it's less flexible. You, you can't, you know, do specific things. But generally speaking, this is a pretty good template to start working from. And uh, these are deployed either, the cluster is either deployed with virtual machines or on bare metal. Mm -hmm. And um, and we can go all the way up to uh, several gigabytes per of RAM per worker if you want, and as many workers as you want per cluster. And, uh, and and being a managed service also is that it will also um, handle any upgrades or uh, or updating to the latest Kubernetes version for you. Mm -hmm. And that uh, that was actually a very um, it's actually very hard to do. Uh, upgrading your infrastructure is not trivial, and doing it with zero downtime is even very it's it's very very complex. And uh, it's actually quite amazing that the uh, the IKS team, the I mean, Kubernetes team has actually been able to, they've had this functionality for a very long time. And uh, whenever you spin up a cluster, it's actually, uh, they, they have the latest Kubernetes version very quickly, and they offer an upgrade path from your existing one to that one um, with zero downtime. So it's, it's very cool stuff. Incredible. You know, I, I feel like on a, for, from a non-developer standpoint, you know, upgrading and, 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 and keeping infrastructure up to date is just one of those things where it's like, you know what, just, just update your infrastructure. Like, what's, what's, what's so hard about that? But then, oh boy, no, that's, that's a whole can of worms that you open and, and, and it can get right. really, really difficult to make sure everything actually continues to work through an update, especially with the zero downtime that you mentioned. That's incredible, right? I assume yep. the way that works, correct me if I'm wrong, is through like rolling the update across multiple, across the multiple work nodes so you're not turning them all off to upgrade at once you're doing it one at a time yeah you've got the right idea there yeah you're kind of doing it uh kind of upgrading one at a time there yeah makes sense all right um, Continue. yeah it, it's definitely like you know taking down your you know weekend application for maintenance is not a big deal but if you're you know uh, an airline yeah. that's you know zero downtime any downtime is, you know, will mean that you are now, someone is now late for their flight. So, yes. <laughs> yeah, not good. Um, <laughs> all right. So let's go and tell our IBM Cloud CLI here to start using uh, this cluster here that I'm borrowing from Pooja. Let's go ahead and spin that up on the command there. Yeah, some warnings. All right. So what it did is uh, it downloaded the, uh, the kube config context. And uh, we're going to help go ahead and let's go ahead this a little bit. There we go. All right. So this is the current context that you're on. So you can say, hey, kubectl, I'm my current context. There you go. And what we want to do now is actually uh, what we're going to do is um, run the command apply. And what we're going to do is we're going to specify this folder config. And before I do this, let's. Well, let's uh, close the Docker file. It's getting a little crowded here. Yeah. Let's go and open these up a little bit here. And there we go. Let's take a look at these files here. Because this is, uh, we want to make sure these are actually working. Mm -hmm. Okay, so over here. Now, this is, you know, it's a lot of Kubernetes stuff in here going on. And uh, actually, you can actually create these. Um, if you actually do a dry run, it'll actually create most of this logic for you. And there's so many jokes now about how we've, you know, <laughs> about YAML now and how it's made things more complicated. <laughs> but, um, you know, there are validators out there that'll, you know, validate the, the YAML structure for you and, you know, even Kubernetes specific ones that'll, 
you know, give you warnings if you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing. But why not use JSON? <laughs> no, continue. <laughs> oh, 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 so so like one of the big differences, uh, just a complete segue, I don't know if it's any reason why they use JSON or not. Uh, in, inline comments, can't have any inline comments in JSON. You actually can. The JSON spec supports that. Eh, sort of. <laughs> um, anyway. <laughs> Continuing. So, continuing. Uh, so this is, means we're going to create a deployment, and these are CRDs, custom resource uh, deployments. Uh, anything that's specified as like a kind here, that's called a CRD. Um, and you know, this is a deployment CRD, and we're just going to name it Node Hello World. You're going to see a lot of that here. Mm -hmm. But one thing that you want to make sure is over here that you're actually uh, giving it the right uh, path for your image. Mm -hmm. And since we changed that, I'm going to actually update that there. Save Mar. Mm -hmm. Save that. Save that. And the same thing with the service. Now, the service kind of governs like, what the deployment does and what ports to run it on. And I think this is fine to use a load balancer, all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. So let's go and actually let's just run this command, and see what happens, deal with any errors that happen. All right, so let's run that. OK, so it created a deployment. Um, instance and a service. Okay. So effectively what you're doing here in the deployment and service YAMLs is you're saying, here's my container and here's how I want to run it. Here's what I want my cluster architecture to be. That's what you're specifying here. Right. And you know, this kind of, we're going to be glossing for some of the details here, but that's the gist of it. And what we're doing is the kubectl command, because it's now linked up with the cluster because we selected it a few, a few commands up there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to apply those, the local YAML files here. It's going to apply those and to, and, you know, set it up on those, set up on that cluster there. And let's try and actually roll out our application here. Okay, so it's a successful rollout. Let's go take a look. Normally, that means it started. Uh, let's go ahead and let's get the service here. Okay, so you can see here, yeah, we have an external IP here and a port. Let's go ahead and pop that up. All right, let's flip back to it. And you can actually get to your Kubernetes dashboard here uh, by clicking over here. And while it loads up, let's see if the application is actually running. And of course, the zoom bar came back because I hit escape at one point. Um, there we go. Is that? Hey, there we go. So there we go. All right. Our application is now running on Kubernetes. Now let's see kind of like what that looks like over here. So here's your dashboard. Here's our hello world and zoom toolbars back. I didn't like this guy. Uh, let's go ahead and click our deployment over here. And there you go. This is our node hello world deployment, our rolling upgrade strategy, how many pods we have available, replica set definitions, all this fun stuff. Mm -hmm. And there you go. Here's our pod. And you can see all the different kind of pods are in one, you know, kind of deployment here. You know, I have visibility to the other pods that Pujo was running. And it's just kind of, you know, it doesn't really have any sort of isolation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, say you have something that's more important or, you know, secure. You don't want everyone in, who has access to the cluster to see it. Um, you know, that's, that's a concern, right? So that's kind of where OpenShift comes in and, and takes Kubernetes and, makes it a little bit more hardened, more security conscious, more has sensible defaults. It's an opinionated version of it. Interesting. So is uh, it is is OpenShift just so I understand sort of the heritage here, is it like uh, you know, something built from scratch with the idea of, of of sort of Kubernetes as inspiration, or is it sort of like a fork with a lot of modifications? Uh I, I'm sure someone at Red Hat would be able to answer that a lot more um, confidently. But I will say that, you know, it's pretty much like they have their own fork. There's an open source uh, project called OKD, mm -hmm. and OKD is um, oh, memory usage went up. And OKD is um, I don't know if it's a straight fork, but a lot of the Kubernetes maintainers are working at Red Hat, and it's the same folks maintaining both OKD and you know contributing changes to Kubernetes also. And um, it looks like also I just searched that up. OpenShift does use Kubernetes at its core. So it is quite literally yeah, Kubernetes I, with a wrap. Definitely use Kubernetes at its core for sure. Uh, I just don't know if specifically it's like a 
you know, for definitively yes or no. Uh, but yeah, it does use Kubernetes at its core. It's not meant to be like inspiration from it. It is Kubernetes. It's a Kubernetes distribution. Yeah. Perfect. Um, okay. So, um, so that was running it on Kubernetes and we saw kind of how that happened. Uh, now we're actually going to run it. Do we have time to run on OpenShift? Do you want to? I think we so. Haven't Let's go ahead and do that. I want to take a look at uh, what, what, what the differences are. All right. Um, you know, I'm going to actually, I forgot to log into the OpenShift cluster. So I'm going to go off screen for just one second. Sure, we can do that. All right. Me... So, yeah, no, I mean, I feel like, you know, within, within different, different fields, um, you get advantages using certain platforms when you have the need for them. Uh, so like, for example, you know, what you mentioned around IBM having a managed Kubernetes service, in some cases, if you really want an extra bit of flexibility, you probably would want to do that deployment yourself. Very few people would actually ever need to do that. But, you know, it's possible that you might have a use case that requires you to deploy Kubernetes across your own infrastructure in your own way. Um, and, and actually, the, the reason I'm bringing that up is because similarly, if if you had a simple application like a Hello World and you did that entire deployment yourself, there would be really no advantage to doing the deployment yourself. Similarly, I feel like for a Hello World, there isn't really that much of a use case for going to something like OpenShift, but it is an interesting sort of uh, way to look at what the differences are between, oh, I deploy it on Kubernetes, I deploy it on OpenShift, yeah. let's see what the differences are. So this doesn't, this example doesn't particularly highlight why you would want to use OpenShift because, of course, I mean, this hello world can very easily be run on Kubernetes. Uh, however, you know, it shows you the idea. So right as you're ready, exactly. you can go ahead and share your screen. I, I've logged in. Sorry, there's a little security token in there we have to input. So let me go and I've logged back in here with my OC login. Um, now I'm actually going to go ahead. And so this is what, uh, this is our OpenShift uh, cluster. You can see it actually looks very familiar to our Kubernetes cluster. <laughs> there's a slight icon change here because it is. Logo. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's because you know it is a it is a distribution of Kubernetes, and it is we have a managed option for that one too, uh, with again same same story, seamless install, seamless you know zero downtime updates, all that stuff. And um, when you log in, uh, you can open the we saw the Kubernetes dashboard before. This is the OpenShift dashboard now. You know, I'm kind of logged in as an administrator, but. Um, you know, you can log in and, and this is kind of like where, where the differences uh, start to happen here is now, you know, you have a little bit more user management uh, control here and you can assign specific users to have access to specific projects. So, you know, there's a lot more projects in here and, and things are divided up. So, you know, maybe I have access to all the projects, but you only have access to, you know, one or two. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I'm going to do over here is actually uh, create a new project called Samples. All right, it's cutting off a little bit too much here. And I'm going to go ahead and use uh, something called source to image, which is a technique uh, um, that is specific to OpenShift, uh, where we're just gonna go ahead, go ahead and give it the source code and tell it to kind of use um, a Node.js uh, container. And let's see if that works here. So we're gonna go ahead and see, okay. It's found a three month old image of OpenShift Node.js under tag 12. All right, it's building, you know, you can read all the logs here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go and actually before we do that, let's see if we can see if it's building in building right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna go ahead and close this. Let's go to our samples. There it is. And our, let's go back to our developer view, actually, samples. This is our hello world. And if you look here, it's actually building it right now. Interesting. So let's go ahead and click view logs. So what actually is interesting here is it's actually not using the Docker file that's in the repo. Mm -hmm. It's actually generating a Docker file. Interesting. So it, it was able to analyze. It's like, hey, this is Node.js, um, you know, because I, I selected, I prefixed it with that Node.js uh, option here. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can see that right there. Yep. And what it's saying here is, if you can read the logs, it's actually generating the Docker file. There it is, and it's you know it knows enough to kind of give a minimal one here, and it works. 
and it's going to run. You see S2Y is probably peppered in here. That's because it's using source to image. Mm -hmm. And there you go. It's doing a whole lot more fun stuff here. And it's actually going to push it up. And now remember with Kubernetes, we need to store this image somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so where are things going to be stored in OpenShift? Well, OpenShift, each deployment of OpenShift has its own internal container registry. Interesting. So it's going to, so all we told it was go to this repo here, right? And it, though it has a Docker file, it's not actually going to be using that. Um, I just do it for, for deploying to Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. But it's actually going to generate that, and it's actually going to push that to uh, the internal registry here. You can see image, OpenShift, internal registry. It's not that US ICR address that we were using oh, before. Wow. All right, so let's go and actually go back to our topology. Here it is. Uh, so it's that's up and running, but we haven't exposed it yet. So let's go ahead and make that publicly available uh, there. Uh, command, let's run that one. Now uh, let's go ahead and click get routes. Mm -hmm. So now it should be available. All right, so you can see now it should have a little, yep, it's got a little like pop up over here. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and click that. And there we go. So we've run the same application like five different ways now. Yeah. Um, and you can see one of the advantages of using uh, OpenShift was, you know, mm -hmm. we didn't need to specify the Docker file. We didn't need to fool around with these little uh, fun little YAML files here, the service or the deployment one. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it, it has, you know, additional security measures. So very nice. So it's more um, sort of, uh, it's, it's a bit more on autopilot here. However, I do assume that this being more of like an you know, enterprise platform, if you did want to customize this, you could, right? If you wanted to provide your own Docker file, for example, you could do that, right? Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Wonderful. And uh, just for fun, this is something everyone likes to see is how we can scale up all the different pods whenever you. Oh, that's you... nice. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There's our pretty little UI to increase the number of pods uh, horizontally, so you can scale it. <laughs> that is that is so satisfying to see. You know, as yeah, as 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 a developer, having having that burden lifted off of your shoulders, and and as being able to click a button and scale. That's that's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone kind of gets a kick out of that one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then there's uh, there's pipelines to actually um, create a, create a whole pipeline so you can you know run a uh, run a linter, run a security check, you know store it in a store it in a registry, and then you know maybe you're generating a library and you want to push that to an artifactory instance, uh, and then finally push your push your code. Um, you know it can do all that, and then there's of course the operator hub which has a bunch of different um, access so if you want a containerized mysql uh you know you can uh, uh where's the database offerings here you know if you want any kind of containerized database there's cockroach db there's couch uh you know you can just click these kind of one click install mm -hmm. and you now have a containerized database running on your cluster so. fascinating yeah. actually interesting question here uh that i have if we if, let's just say I have like um, you know something that actually we were working on a little while ago, but I, I didn't end up sort of continuing, um, is let's just say I had a task where um, I wanted to run some sort of like high performance compute um, workload. So let's just say I had a bunch of computers working to find. Um, the nth sum of squares problem, right? And so that would require, you know, tons and tons of cores and, you know, already, you know, getting to 10 to the 14 requires like 192 threads uh, and, and, and let, even that takes like 40 minutes. Um, could I deploy that and, and distribute that workload across a Kubernetes cluster? <sighs> Well, I think because you're still going to be bound by like actual memory constraints of that specific pod. I don't know if that would help in this specific instance. This oh. use case doesn't really require all that much memory, and also okay. none of the processes need to talk to each other. It's it's an embarrassingly parallel workload. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, maybe you and I should just go ahead and give this a shot after the call. That's an interesting, uh, very interesting problem. Look out for a yeah. YouTube video on that. <laughs> because what what. With pods, you really want it to be kind of like stateless applications. Yeah. You don't want it to be like stateful. Yeah. Um, so I guess like depending on how your answer is like constructed, it's going to change uh, whether I say yes or no. You so. know, I, I feel like 
in a way, maybe it could work if the actual task was long running enough. And also if we made it stateless in the sense of they don't just inherently go ahead and start calculating, they expose yeah. a service that you can then call for exactly. the calculation to happen. And then Kubernetes yeah. can distribute that workload automatically think, because you can just keep making calls and it'll keep distributing it. I um, think that would be very uh, much, I think that would be much, much faster in that, in that regard. So if you we'll have like a straight contract, <laughs> uh, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks for thanks for answering that question. No, I, I will definitely go ahead and try that out. Do stay tuned, everybody, for more you know Kubernetes and, and, and OpenShift content. This should be a really fun little uh, new uh, you know avenue for me to explore. Uh, and also, <laughs> yes, go ahead. No, I was going to say you got to broaden that top of the T. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I got to broaden that top of the T more. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, all the links promised will be in the description for today's video, the IBM Cloud Essentials course, as well as the other vi video that I've done with Leo on containerization and what that means for developers and, and, and the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, so feel free to go ahead and check that out as well. All right. Now, one more question that I do want to take up uh, really quickly is from Shiva mm -hmm. asking, will Podman replace Docker? What do you think? Oh, no. <laughs> can't really give a, you know, whenever one tool tries to like uh, displace another, I feel like it ends up getting a good chunk of the market share, but it, there's always, you know, diehards that are just going to, I think the, the Docker was such a great tool and I think people just have so much muscle memory for it. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's going to be a long time till we have a definitive answer on that one. But I mean, yeah. you know, I, I, I could be wrong. I mean, look at VS Code. That thing <laughs> displaced all the other editors in like a year. <laughs> uh, but some of us are still going to stick by Vim. No. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, you're, you're right. I, I feel like it sort of goes right back to the, um, uh, to, to the question of, um, of, of, of replacing tools like with compilers, right? We have Clang, which is orders of magnitude better than GCC. Uh, well, it's, 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 it's a better compiler, right? It's, it's more modular, it has compiler extension support, it has the LLVM backend, it has all these other languages that are contributing to LLVM and so many other things. Um, and yet, just because the fact that GCC is older and just people have yeah. been using it, they're like, we'll just keep using it, even though Clang yep. is like a drop-in replacement mostly. Uh, <laughs> but but we're starting to see the community shift, right? Like even the IBM XL compilers are now based off of Clang. So, you know, if, if IBM XL can now support Clang, people are, I hope, people will start to uh, to shift over more. Um, so, so again, you know, I, I feel like Podman too, even, even if it is a lot better until it provides some sort of like clear business justification of like, it's going to save you X amount of money. And until businesses really start pushing it, I don't think it's going to fully replace Docker, uh, but yeah. uh, you yeah. know, we can, we, we can, we can hope. And as a matter yeah. of fact, I actually haven't taken a look into like the whole technical advantages of Podman either. I don't know what the specific reasons are for wanting to replace Docker. So I'll, I'll take a look at that as well, for sure. Yeah. There's the, there's the old saying that like, you know, whenever someone says this is just a temporary fix, that means it's, it's now permanent. And I feel <laughs> like it's the same thing whenever, you know, first to market is really hard to displace. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I will, we'll see the answer there. Sounds good. And also yeah. one more question actually from Shiva yeah. asking, what fascinates you about deploying apps uh, on IBM Cloud? So do you have experience with other cloud environments? You know, what specifically is it that you enjoy about the IBM Cloud deployment experience? Um, just not, I'm just really familiar with it. I've had to do some stuff on uh, GCP and uh, AWS, and actually, I think I've used I used Azure back in like 2017. I don't know how much it's changed since then. Mm -hmm. um, and like Heroku, I've, I've you know I've poked around on all of them, and um, you know I'm you know we, we use IBM Cloud here because we are IBM. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, there's you know I feel like the 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 value add is really around the surrounding services. I mean, yes. you know. Each cloud provider is going to have, you know, uh, an infrastructure option to spin up VMs. They're all going to have something like a pass offering. They're all going to have a Kubernetes offering. So it's like, which service are you now using in addition to that? That's mm -hmm. going to, you know, based on your business requirements or your application requirements, what are you going to lean toward? Um, so I think that's kind of like what's going to drive you to pick different cloud providers. Absolutely. It really comes down to 
you know, I feel like a lot of these, a lot of these cloud providers have a lot of duplication across them, um, yeah. right? Like, I mean, we we discussed this with Leo and Steve Astorino and 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 Imesh Gupta, uh, Gupta um, and, and a lot of other guests. And you know, we we we've covered how there's a lot of duplication across cloud environments just because they kind of have to have that because that's a very standard thing. Um, but then from there, the, the differentiation comes in the unique services that they provide. Maybe IBM has better cognitive services. Maybe Google has better, you know, TensorFlow integration and TPUs. Maybe Azure has better, you know, integration with Bing search, or whatever it is that they have. So, so <laughs> for... <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 to be fair, to be fair, Bing does have a couple of really unique APIs, like their news API, which, you know, unfortunately, Google hasn't been you, able to match. you hear it. about their new service? Excuse me? The, their new service. It was called Clippy as a service. No, I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> well, we've got Cast. I'm now. kidding. <laughs> I love my Microsoft friends. Uh, well, you know, Clippy, Clippy, they, should bring out, they should bring back Clippy and power it with Watson Assistant. But <laughs> anyway, no, that's, <laughs> that would be a really interesting crossover episode. But uh, no, that would be, <laughs> that, that would be fun. <laughs> right. So no, thank you very much, Steve, for, for showing us all these different you know, ways of, of deploying applications. This has been a lot of fun. Really quickly, I do want to ask you before we go today, you know, one of the things that, uh, that that I get asked a lot, and as a matter of fact, you know, every time I do like an Ask Tanmay episode or, or every time I bring on a developer on the show, one of the things that people ask is, you know, what's, what, what's, what's your favorite programming language? And, and people know that for me that the answer is definitely going to be like Swift and, <laughs> and, and Julia and, you know, these, these sorts of Go, for example, right? Um, but, but what about you? What's, what's your favorite and what's your most despised programming language? <laughs> despised. <laughs> I don't really have a despised one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, C does C never really sat well with me. Um, oh. Maybe it just depended on on you know the, the way I took it in university and you know the the whole mess of messing around with pointers and memory allocation just really did not that just didn't really <laughs> gel. Um, I say uh, my favorite language though is definitely Python. Um, Interesting. You know, we had a and and not just from like a data science you know machine learning point of view. Um, I just think it's, uh, I, I used it a lot for about five years straight working on the OpenStack project. And it was, um, it, it just really, um, I felt like I grew a lot as a developer uh, during that time. And I think now it's kind of like my go-to whenever I need to write a little script to, you know, scrape some data or, mm -hmm. you know, make a quick little application or it just really anything. It's kind of like my go-to language now. Makes um, sense. I've just, you know, I, I just through using it for five years, I got a really good understanding of, you know, these are the libraries that are well maintained. This is standard. This is the standard lib. And, you know, it's kind of like back of hand now. And if I just need to really do something quick, I, I, I do that. Right, absolutely. Yeah, no. Python's one of those languages where it's just really, really easy to get started. And it's like, if I want to do something, I don't need to write a lot of ceremony. It's just I can import my libraries, get to implementing my business exactly. logic immediately. <laughs> exactly. So yep. It works, but then once you start getting into the whole high performance stuff, that's when it starts to kind of break down. Yeah. And, and that's when you start needing to resort to like a Swift or a C or, or, or something. Um, and as a matter of fact, actually, you mentioned, you know, being able to progress. So much as, as a developer in those five years as you were using you know Python and 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 and, and as you were building these projects uh, another question that I'm sort of curious about is throughout your career as you've worked on different projects what has been from the from a technical standpoint at least for you the most interesting project to work on uh, the most interesting one uh, I think that definitely during my time on OpenStack for sure I was there was uh, I, I was the project lead for a component that handled uh, identity and uh, authorization mm -hmm. and access management. So I had to, you know, in, in addition to just uh, making sure that the project, you know, had the underlying functionality to, you know, create policies, create access controls. Uh, we also had to net integrate with LDAPs. Uh, if you don't know what an LDAP is, um, you, you'll know what it is as blue pages at IBM Tanmay. Wow. So every employee information is in an LDAP mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, user information uh, is all stored in there, depending on, you know, the department that they're in, the role that they're in. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also, so we had to integrate um, our service with those LDAPs and, you know, keep it, 
you know, store those kind of relationships also. Mm -hmm. And then we had to, uh, afterward, we had to get into federated identity, which, you know, ties into single sign on. So if you ever, you know, you're on Stack Overflow and you want to sign in as, oh. instead of creating another account there, you can say, hey, I want to sign in with my Google account. Mm -hmm. You know, that there, that's single sign on. And right. we had to include that in the product too. And uh, it's actually one of the more fulfilling things is that, you know, OpenStack is still used by CERN. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the Adam smashers there. Wow. And, uh, you know, one of the, they were one of the big stakeholders for single sign on support because you can imagine they work with a lot of universities yeah. and they wanted to have that kind of single sign on to support for all the different universities in there. And I think they're still using it. So uh, a lot of the stuff that I went and, uh, developed with some of the other developers there is still being used today. So I'm very proud of that one. So that's very nice. Yeah. That's, that's, um, that's absolutely great to hear. You know, yeah. from, from, a, from a developer standpoint, being able to build something like that that actually has an impact and is actually able to solve a problem, I think right. that's really satisfying, right? Like a lot of the things that I've worked on, they've been really fun from a technical standpoint sometimes, but the things that I'm most sort of excited about are the ones that have actually had an impact on, on people and, and, and have been used, right? So... Uh, yeah. that's, that's, that's definitely really fun to hear. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Steve, once again. Now, really quickly, before we, before we leave today and before, before we end, this, end the stream, I do want to ask you one more thing. You know, you've gotten a bit of a feel for uh, what the audience is like. You know, they've asked a bunch of questions. And before we leave, would you like to share maybe a closing message with them as to, you know, your, what, 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 what you'd like to leave them with? Um, thanks for watching. And, uh, I'm excited to see what actually happens in the one year inaugural in, in two episodes, right? It should be coming up in two weeks, right? Yep. <laughs> so I, I think we should all kind of tune in and see what happens in two weeks on this, uh, on that episode. Cause I, I think you're going to have something big and special. We'll see. Well, thank you very much. I'm looking <laughs> forward to it <laughs> for the one year anniversary of, of, of tech life skills and, and hopefully many more episodes to come. I'm really looking forward to it. And so okay. it was great to have you on the 50th episode, actually the, uh, uh getting halfway to a hundred. Um, and of course I'm looking forward to potentially having you on again really soon and, and, and doing some more developer focused content again anybody that has any more questions or suggestions of you know what you'd like to see from uh from really any sort of technical standpoint feel free to put that in the comments and we can bring on steve once again and and, and yeah. talk more about that tech and so once again thank you very much steve for joining today thank you everybody for joining on the live stream of course make sure you join us on sunday of course as always tech live skills will be doing a student special episode uh and we'll get to hear from once again the next generation of technologists and so Please do join us on Sunday, 11 a.m. Eastern time, and I will see you then. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye. See ya.